This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. He will not break a bruised reed. I have a word for you from the Lord this morning. Start in verse 1, Isaiah 42. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment or justice to the Gentiles. This is speaking of Christ, the Messiah. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged. He has set judgment or justice in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Heavenly Father, we come to you now with open hearts and open ears, and we're asking you to speak to us from heaven, from your heart. Lord, I speak now at this time in my life as a father, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would you, you are my father. You've spoken to me with gentleness. You've spoken to me with your everlasting tender kindness. And give me that kind of heart. Let me feel and know, Lord Jesus, what it is to, to just be a channel or a voice of your heart. Lord, sanctify the vessel now so that the word can come forth pure and clean and holy before you. Speak to hearts, Lord. You've brought some people here this morning and for a special reason. And you have prepared a word for them, O oh God, that could change their life if they'll just open their hearts to hear. In Christ's name I pray, amen. This is a prophecy of Isaiah that was, has been fulfilled in Matthew 12. In Matthew 12, Jesus is in a synagogue. It's on the Sabbath, and a man comes uh, or is in the audience with a withered hand, and Jesus heals this man on a Sabbath. And now the leaders of the church body are together in conference trying to find the time and place to kill him, only because he healed a man on the Sabbath. And when Jesus heard this, the Bible said he went his way. And the scripture, Isaiah said, you'll not hear him on the streets. You will not hear him. See, he didn't come to force people to hear him. He didn't come to uh, with a, a loud clamor. He didn't come with noise. He, he's not going to take revenge. You're not going to hear him on the street railing against these who are planning his death. The scripture, the Isaiah said, he, he shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He had the power, he had the authority to call down angels. He could have dealt with them. He was not like the disciples who wanted to call fire down out of heaven. And he could have done that. But the loving heart of Christ said, no, I'll just leave them. And he went out a ways from the temple and he began to minister to the multitudes that came to him that were hungry. And it's in this context that Isaiah said, and it is quoted now about Jesus Christ, he will not break the bruised reed. Now, a reed is a long, narrow plant with a hollow uh, trunk, and it's a tender plant, and it's usually found in marshes. It's found near water supply, and it grows tall, but it bends also. It bends under the winds. It bends under special waves, or if a flood comes, it can bend it down, and oftentimes it breaks and is carried away with the flood. And Jesus said, the Scripture said of him, and Isaiah said, Behold, in the first verse, my servant who sent my elect in whom my soul delighteth, 
in whom my spirit dwells. The prophet Isaiah is saying, let me tell you something about this Christ that's coming. Let me tell you what it's like, because he's going to come to a bruised society, a bruised society that was under the Roman rule, a bruised and broken people because of the priesthood taking advantage of the poor and the widows and being mocked and ridiculed. The Bible said all the prophets spoke of the time that Christ would come would be an hour of darkness. The people that sat in darkness, sit in darkness would see a great light. And Jesus came into a demon-possessed, broken society, absolutely broken. This was a society of broken reeds. The flood tides of the Roman Empire, of the evil homosexuality that spilled out of the bowels of Rome, all of the cheating and the stealing and the robbing and all of the hypocrisy. And Jesus came into that bruised society. And the word says he will not break a bruised reed. I want to talk to you this morning about this tender, loving Christ in two aspects. I want to talk to you about the tenderness of Christ prophesied by Isaiah, this man who had come. Let me tell you something about the Jesus you serve and that I serve. We think we know so much about him. We study his nature. We study all of the... Uh, circumstances about his life and his time here on earth. But I don't think we fully understand the meaning of this and uh, the absolute loving kindness of our Christ for his people and for the world. God sent his son into the world not to judge it, but to save it. How many agree with me? He came to save this world, not to condemn it. Jesus said, I'm not your judge now. I'm your savior. I want to talk to you about God's just, or God's tenderness to America and to the nations of the world at this time. I'm sure if you are a Bible, you love the Word of God and you believe that to be the revealed Word of God, the absolute Word of the living God. And when you read all the prophecies and you read of what happened to nations in the past, You read of the fallen empires, Roman and Greece, and you read of Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood. You you read of the time when God lost patience after so much love, after preaching for 120 years of mercy to Noah's generation, and then God says it's enough. And the question is, why is it that God has not judged America up to this time? Why is it that a nation that has killed... uh, millions of unborn babies? Why is it that we are not under judgment now? Because you see, when, when I grew up, in fact, till I was 15, 16 years old, a teenager, you know, the Bible was in the school, and fought. many of the lessons were Bible lessons, right in school, all the way to the 10th grade, I remember, and, and especially in, in junior and uh, grade school. The Bible was used as a partial textbook. Many of the lessons were Bible stories. And look where we've come from now, where here in New York City, you can put a Koran on the teacher's desk, you can put a Playboy, you put a Bible, here you'll lose your job. And, and how God has been pushed out of our schools, pushed out of our court system, and ridiculed, And what has happened, it has left a bruised society without any moral compass. We are living in a time when psychoanalysts, psychologists, sociologists cannot keep up with a flood of people wanting just one hour to talk about their distress. The the, the church uh, counseling teams everywhere are overburdened, even in the church of Jesus Christ, the distress, the, the, the stress of finances. Folks, if we got what we deserved, we would be in ruin right now. This nation would have been destroyed if God was not a God of mercy. And it's only the mercy of God. You've heard of daylight saving time. We're on tender mercy time right now. We're on tender mercy time. 
you, I see it not only here in the United States, but everywhere we travel. Europe is far more secular than the United States. When, when uh, I travel to some of these nations, this new uh, European Union is absolutely secular. Secular is absolutely godless. They do not want God mentioned in any of their meetings. If you have anything to do with God or the Bible or anything that is spiritual, you'll be looked upon as a lunatic. We held a meeting in Brussels, and that's where I believe will emerge the seat of the Antichrist. That's where the European Union meets, and you feel that spirit when you walk the street of arrogance against God. You find it now in all over Europe. I prophesied in, in Sweden. The Spirit of the Lord came on me. I was in one hour in an afternoon. The Lord opened up from Amos a prophecy. And I stood in front of the Swedish congregations there. And, and my message was God's controversy with Sweden, all with the evangelical churches in Sweden. And it was about apathy. The richer they grow, it's one of the richest nations now, and the richer it grows, the more apostasy and apathy comes. Ireland is being prospered now. It's becoming very apathetic and absolutely secular. God is being pushed out of Europe. You, you, you see all of these things developing, and you see the world system spinning out of control, and you see signs of God warning time and time again. He, God can stop terrorist attacks any time he chooses. He just sends an angel. He can speak a word. Any terrorist thing. 9-11 could have been hindered if God chose to. It, it, God didn't allow it, but God allows something. God has all of nature under control. And God's been speaking to our nation. He's been speaking to the whole world. He's been speaking to the whole world. Tsunamis. Uh, earthquakes. And now when, when I, I've just come home from Europe again and nobody seems to care. That it's all right. If judgment's coming, well, let's live it up until it comes. Let's just eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. There's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of need of God. And it breaks your heart. And you see Christians falling into the cracks now. You, you, you see, uh, I get letters, letter after letter after letter on our mailing list to those who, who are writing to me now and say, I, I, I go to such and such. These are usually mega churches. And, and there's no preaching anymore about sin. And even pastors tell me, I've backslidden. I've gone to, they say, I go to a church now where there's no worship. There's no sense of Christ's presence. There's never a tear. There's never any brokenness. And one church that was advertised, or story in uh, the New York Times just a month ago, a, a Pentecostal church uh, with 10,000 people, and, and it says, uh, we're here to make you happy. But you see, it's not bringing happiness. It's bringing despair and distress and backsliding and coldness of heart. And you look at all of this and you say, Lord, I don't, I don't want judgment. There's nobody here in this, within the sound of my voice. If you love Christ and you walk in true holiness before God, you could not want judgment on this nation or any nation or on any people. And folks, I'm just as human as anybody else. I would like to just live under the long suffering of God till I die and there's prosperity. That would be fine. I don't want to have to see tears in the eyes of my children and grandchildren. I don't want to see these things that are coming. I, I, I like it the way it is. That would be nice. But the only reason it is as it is now is because God somewhere in this nation has found some bruised reeds that still want to take a stand. He has found some wicks that are just smoldering. It's just smoke now. They were once on fire. Churches that were on fire. 
people that were on fire. He said, I will not extinguish a smoldering flax. That's a wick in a lamp. And that wick, when it goes down in Bible times, there was a snuffer, a little cap, and they would snuff it out when it was smoking, snuff it out. And he said, I will not snuff out. The fire may be gone. There's no appearance of fire. There's no appearance of anything alive. But I see something. I hear a cry from some people. I hear something from hearts. And I believe in every church that's backslidden. I believe in every Catholic church. I believe that in every church in the United States and around the world, God has at least one. He's got two. He's got a holy remnant that still burn and still cry and pray. And God says, I'll not break that bruised reed as long as I hear a cry. He has not broken this nation yet. He's given warnings. Yes, and the time is getting short. But he said, I will not break a bruised reed. Let me talk to you about the tenderness of Jesus Christ toward his people. I, I was in the Spirit this past week in prayer. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly that I had to speak this word today because there would be in this service this morning those who are bruised, reeds. That, that word bruise has many meanings. It means to be hurt, pounded to pieces. It concludes injured feelings, crushed by unfulfilled expectations. And there are people sitting here now in the annex and here in the main auditorium. And even though you sang and even though you may have clapped your hands and rejoiced in the Lord, yet you have been bruised. There's a bruise and there, there comes a breaking point, a breaking point that I want to talk about. Some of you are close to a breaking point. You're bruised and you're wounded. And the fire seems to have gone out. It seems to have ebbed down so low there's nothing left, you think, but smoke. That's, you're that smoldering wick. I have received a letter this past week from a missionary couple, bruised. A number of years ago, the Holy Spirit, they said, told them to sell everything. Give it away or sell it and go to the mission field. They went to, I think it was Africa, and they spent seven years in a Bible school and teaching and into the villages and gave their lives. The Holy Spirit told them after seven years they needed to return home. And they came home, no money, no house, nothing. And they didn't give me the details of where they're living, but he, he is a skilled man, well-educated, began looking for jobs and putting in resumes. And every, he put out resume after resume, and he'd always end up in, in the top four or five that would be interviewed. And he would go to the interview and be moved up to second place time and again and then get the word that, Another man got the job. And finally, after praying and fasting and seeking God, and they were, they were crushed in the question, Lord, why are you testing us this way? Because we pray, we fast, we've given our life on the mission field. There's no controversy with God. Why are we at this point? And they came they were, they were bruised in spirit and in their heart. And he, they, the letter that came to me came right after the worst of all that could have happened to them. A, a Christian man invited him to come and be interviewed with the company. And he said, there are two of you. And this, this was a job that he knew he could do. He was qualified for it. And he felt good about it. And the boss whined and dined him for you know, when I say one, I'm talking about just eating and set him up, uh, almost assuring him that he had the job. And then he gets a call that he didn't get it. And the other man was awarded the job. 
And that's when I hear about the breaking point. The breaking point. You see, if you want to see a bruised man in the Bible, you go to the Old Testament, to Elijah. Elijah, a man of prayer, whose prayers open and shut the heavens. Here's a man who knew God as few men knew him. Here's a man who had such spiritual authority that he could stand before 400 of the idolatrous priest of Baal, take a sword in his hand and slay them all single-handedly. Here's a man with such power and authority. And here's a man upon whom the Spirit comes with such might that he outruns Ahab's chariot almost 20 miles to Jezreel. But when he gets there, Jezebel sends a message to tell him, I'm going to kill him. And fear comes upon him. And the next scene is Elijah, a day's journey, dismissed his servant. And he's laying almost asleep under a juniper tree, totally discouraged, totally hurting. Here's a man. There's no reason whatsoever. There's no reason in his thinking that this should happen to him. He's lived for years seeing miracles. He's seen the hand of God on his life. He's not living in sin. But now he's distressed. He is a broken reed. Broken. Let me tell you, there are some of you at that point now, you are bruised. It may be because of your finances. You say, God, I've served you faithfully. I've been your servant. I've done everything. And now here I am facing a hopeless situation. And I'm tested beyond all my human capacity. Some of you may be fighting a a besetting sin. And you've come to the end of yourself. You're at a breaking point because you say, I've done everything I've heard from the pulpit. I have gone to the Holy Spirit for sanctifying power. I have read my Bible faithfully. I have prayed and sought God. But then all of a sudden, here it comes out of nowhere, something that is in my past that I thought was over and gone. And here I am fighting the same battle I fought when I got saved. There's some of you in a marriage situation right now, and it's brought you near the breaking point, and you are a bruised reed. And you're holding on for dear life because you know what the Bible says about divorce. You've prayed for him. You have tried to show Jesus to him. You've done everything, but it blows up in your face. And here's what happens when you are down under that juniper tree. And that's where some of you are now. You're down, discouraged and heartbroken and not understanding. And when you're down and when the enemy comes in like a flood, the devil will come to you with lies He will come to you and say, uh, what kind of a Christian are you? You don't practice what you preach. You really have a filthy, unchangeable nature. You have deceived God. All kinds of lies will come into your mind, but your conscience most of all will come at you. And that conscience will say to you, you're not praying like you did one time. You're not studying the word like you should. You've dried up. You're lukewarm. Your fire has gone out. You're not a good testimony. You don't practice what you preach. You don't have what it takes. You've allowed the devil to rob you of everything God ever gave you. Your conscience will come and just beat on you and bring Then then the word of God will try you. The Bible says of Joseph, until his time came, the word of God tried him. And the word will try you when you're down and you're hurting and you're bruised. And now just a smoking flax because, folks, I've been there and I know what it's like. Many of you there. And if you're not there, hold on. I'm not trying to scare you, but it comes to all of us. It may last for some just a week, for some it lasts months. But that time will come. That testing time will come. And when that comes, the Word of God will try you because you're hurting and you're down. And you're, you, you are stressed. 
And you try to put it out of the mind and keep saying, Lord, I'll, I'll trust you, I'll trust you, I'll trust you. But your faith begins to waver because that's the flame. That's the flame. That's the flick that's dying. That, that, that wick that's, that's smoldering. It's faith. The devil is trying to destroy the faith of this man. This faith of this man that can believe God to make turn a little cloud into a thunderstorm. And lick up. Twelve barrels of water around an altar and send fire supernaturally from heaven. That's the kind of faith this man had. And now he's sitting there not wanting to hear a word. He's not wanting to pray. I've been there. I'm saying, Lord, I just heard. I don't know what to do. And you just want to sleep. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? I want to go to bed. That's what the Bible says. And, and he fell asleep. He fell asleep. Why? Because he can't carry the burden anymore. It's, been, it, it's just too much for him. And gee, our, our, our Lord, our precious Father, looked at that man hurting and bruised at the end of his rope. Not able to explain to anybody, not wanting to pray. He didn't want to hear another prophet come and say, what are you doing here? If God tells him, fine, and God did, but he, he didn't want that. You come to a place where you don't want to pray. There's no urgency. You love God. You love Jesus probably more than you've ever loved him. But you just have no urgency to pray. You open the Bible and the pages run together. And you fall asleep reading the Bible. And your conscience beating on you. And all of those words, remember the foolish virgins. They were cast out because their lamps went out. What about you? Your lamp is going out. You're a foolish virgin. And you'll hear it pray without ceasing. Pray with all your heart, your mind, soul, and strength. Pray earnestly, pray fervently. You're sitting there, I can't even speak. I know I'm not speaking into the wind. The Word of God will try you. You get your Bible out and look at that and say, I can't handle that. I can't handle it. And the Lord knows that. He saw this. He's broken. He, he, he's a reed that's bent over and the flood has come. Fear to attack his faith and rob him of all of his faith. He's under attack and he's about to break it. But God made him a promise. I will not break a bruised reed. I will not snuff out the wick that is smoldering. He knew this man still had this breath of faith in him. He knew this man's heart. And an angel comes, not a rebuke, not a renouncing, but an angel with food. And the angel wakes him up. And he said, Elijah, rise up and eat. Oh, thank God he prepares meals for those that are hurting. You see, I'm not an angel and I can prove it. Just ask the woman that just talked to you. I'm not an angel, but I'm a messenger. I'm a messenger. And I've come with a meal. And I'm that messenger that's tapping you on the shoulder and said, Hey, wake up. God's not mad at you. He's not going to let you break under this. You're not going down. And I want to... I want to scream that. I want to sit with the love of Christ and the tenderness of a loving Savior. Don't believe the lie that you're going to be crushed. The, the devil's going to have the upper hand. No, the Lord said, I will not allow you to be broken. I will not allow the fire to go out. The fire's still there. I'm going to blow on that flame and it'll come back again. Uh, 
I, God was so patient with Elijah for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, he gave him two meals, woke him up twice. No rebuke. He just he said, now, you're going to have to eat because the path, your journey is too hard for you. Uh, does anybody get that? Look, the Lord said, this is too much for you. And Lord said, I'm going to be patient. So for 40 days and 40 nights, he endures what this man goes through without a word of rebuke. He waits for 40 days and 40 nights with the man that's just walking almost blindly, almost hopeless, wounded in spirit, refusing to be encouraged at that moment. I, I think if I'd saw an angel twice, I might be encouraged. But he's still, and God just tenderly waits 40 days and 40 nights till he gets to the cave in Mount Horeb. And folks, this man is at a crossroads because, you see, God said, I won't break the bruised reed. But there comes a time God says, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to tell it to you very lovingly, and be very straight. And so after 40 days and 40 nights, God comes on the scene. Now, if you're down, what kind of message do you want to hear to wake you up? Do you, do you want thunder? Because that's what happened. The thunder came and shook the rocks. This was a, this was in God's hand. Thunder. There, there are a lot of people who think that's the only thing that's going to wake them out of their sloth and unbelief and what they're going through. But the Bible said God wasn't in the thunder. I wasn't God speaking. He said, no, I'm not going to treat you that way. Well, what about an earthquake? And shake the very ground you stand on. Maybe... Is that the kind of word you want? You're hurting. Do you want the pastor to stand and, and, and just give you a, a, an earthquake sermon? Red hot thunder, lightning, and everything shaking around you. And, and heaven's lit up. Repent or else. How about Fire. I hear preachers being advertised as fiery. He's so fiery. I, I believe in Holy Ghost fire preaching if it's through brokenness and tears. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the thunder. What was the voice that brought him out? Still, small voice. And many manuscripts say, a soft wind came, a soft breeze, a refreshing breeze. And in a whisper, God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? You know what he's saying? I can't let you settle down in this kind of despair. I can't let you live like this. I've loved you, and I'm patient with you, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some direction now. And he gave him direction. He gave him three specific directions that he was to take. Now comes obedience. Now God is requiring faith. And the only way you're going to get out, the only way I've ever come out of this time where I was at a breaking point, and in my travels, I see it in the ministry, especially hundreds of thousands of pastors in the past three years who have wanted to quit the ministry and are quitting the ministry because they reached a broke, breaking point and they broke. Because they would not they would not listen to that still, small voice. I'm going to give you. From the word of God. From James 5.11, here's your meal. Here is your food. I said Elijah got a meal from an angel. 
you're getting a meal now from a servant. This is what the Lord spoke to my heart. James 5.11. We have seen the end or the outcome of the Lord's dealings. The Lord is pitiful and of tender mercies. Look this way for just a moment. God is not mad at you. He's not just trying to test you right now. The test is nearing its end. And the Lord knows that some of you are at the breaking point. You've got to rely on his word now. And, and, and you have to start feeding on what God is bringing. If you'll feed, he'll, he'll offer, he'll bring the food if you just have a hunger. And say, Lord, I want you to feed me. And every time that the enemy has come against me over 50 years of ministry, I've had to come to this place where Elijah came. Lord, I believe that you'll speak to me. I believe that my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he abides. And I can't imagine the Holy Ghost abiding in me and not speaking to me. He abides in me. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And I have to lay hold of that and say, Jesus, live or die. I believe that you abide in me. I believe that my sins are under the blood. I don't know what this is all about. I can't handle it. I know the journey's too much, but I know you're with me. I know that you are with me. And that's what this whisper from God is. He's saying, I'm going to take you a new way of life. You're not going to be judgmental like you often were, Elijah, because now you see how I work with you, how I want you to work with others around you, not to judge your husband or your wife or your children, not to stand as judges, but to show them the tender mercies and that still small voice. No more screaming mothers trying to save their kids through screaming. No more shouting wives that try to berate their husbands and just losing it. No more of husbands putting down their wives. This is all about how we live. This is, this is practical stuff, friends. It's not some, it's some kind of theology out there in the heavens. It has to do with how we live. And if we're going to come to church and sing and shout and praise the Lord and talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost, we had better know something about Christ alive in our hearts. We'd better know that the Holy Ghost that we say lives and abides and who has baptized us is here when I need him. And when I hurt, that I can cry out to him and he will not shut his voice. He will not shut his ears and he will whisper to you, everything's going to be all right because I'm with you. Fear not. My closing word, go to Psalm 103. And I want you to stand. I want you to stand as we, we read. You say you believe the Bible is the... Revealed Word of God? All right, then take this to your heart. Psalm 103, I'm going to read all the way down to verse 13. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies the mouth, thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executed righteousness and justice, judgment for all that are oppressed. He makes known his ways unto, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is what? Merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide. In other words, he'll not keep you in suspense. Neither will he keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as far he has removed our transgression from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers we're just dust. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah for your word. Raise your hands and give God thanks for his word. Just praise him. Lord, thank you for the word of the Lord. The word that gives us life and gives us strength. Now, while you stand, I have one appeal. One invitation. If this message was for you. Now, it may have meant, I don't know. Five or ten people, but I, I, I suspect it's. More like the hundreds. If you say, Pastor Dave Wilson, I'm bruised. And some of them have to say, I'm, I'm at a breaking point. But that's when God moves with his great mercy. And he came with a message to you this morning. You were not browbeaten. You were not condemned. Holy Spirit sent a message on the revelation of Christ and his tenderness towards you and your problem. It's not mad. It's not the anger of God. It's a test of faith. That's all it was with Elijah. He had lost his faith and fear. Fear has torment. And I'll tell you right now, your problem started with a fear. There was a moment when fear was allowed to take root in your heart. And you stand here afraid of the future, afraid of this, afraid of that. There's a fear. And that fear is causing the wick of faith to just smolder. But the Lord knows. And the Lord wants to breathe on you. He wants to heal your spirit and renew your faith. If you don't know Christ... If you don't have a living personal relationship with Jesus Christ, up in the balcony floor and in the annex and overflow. In the annex overflow, you can step forward and stand between the screens. Here in the main auditorium, upstairs, and uh, here, you come down the stairs on either side. You come. I'll pray with you right here at the front. Just come and say, Pastor David, today God spoke to me. And I want to pray that you have the promise that God will not fail you, but you've got to renew your faith before the Lord, the renewing of your faith. Now, I could give you a little speech, what you ought to do, but I'm just going to give you the word, and I want you to listen closely. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, of great mercy. The Lord is good to all And his tender mercies are over all his works. The Lord is near to all those who call upon him. Those that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those that fear him. He will also hear your cry and save you. The Lord preserves all of those who love him. Of all the wicked, he destroys. He heals the broken in heart. He binds up their wounds. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. The Lord preserves the stranger. The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. Do you want to please God? He said he takes pleasure in them who hope in his tender mercies. You that come forward, would you raise a hand that just says, Lord, here I am, I surrender. Just raise a hand and pray this prayer with me from your heart. Lord Jesus, I accept your mercy. I rejoice in your mercy. You know my heart. You know what I'm going through. But I'm coming to you with it to cast all my care upon you. Pluck the fear out of my heart. Forgive my unbelief. Jesus, I give you all. And you know that. You see my heart. So I come now with faith, childlike faith, to rejoice in your mercy to me. To thank you for your tender mercies to me. Lord, I want to give you pleasure. Now I want you to just thank him with your voice. Thank him with your voice. Right out loud, I give you thanks, Jesus. I give you. You 
praise. Now, I want to pray for everyone who came forward that the Lord would help you right now to release your fears. I'm telling you, that's where it starts. Your fear. But God said, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. You've got a good mind. You know how to make a living. Then you need to lay, be assured you know how to lay hold of this truth right now. If God has not given me this spirit of fear that's upon me, why should I put up with it? It's from the enemy. God didn't put this on me. I've not given you a spirit of fear. Lord, I come against the spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus Christ, whom I serve. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord of glory. I ask you to come right now and smite every fear. Lord, that's what you did in that cave with Elijah. You came in a still small voice and you plucked the fear out of his heart and he became fearless. And one day later stood before Ahab. And Ahab said, oh, you found me. Oh, God, you used this man. You blessed this man. Now bless this people that come with open hearts. Will you lay down your fear right now? Say, Jesus, I give you my fear. This is the conclusion of the message. This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. Uh, as I mentioned, these are very perilous times, and I hear people saying this is World War III. You hear it everywhere you go. But this past week, I, I started writing down, before I preach, I just want to tell you something that, that should give you a perspective. You have to get a perspective from history. If you just take it issue by issue and event by event, you not capture uh, the full picture of what is going on. Let me tell you my memories of just what has happened in my lifetime concerning Israel and the Mideast and all of the armies that have gathered over the years. And I just wrote this down. I'm going to go through what my notes are, and then I'm going to preach. Uh, I think we'll call this, His Eye is on the Sparrow. His eye is not on the Mideast right now. His eye is on the sparrow, which means you and I. But in 1967, a terrorist organization called Al-Fatah terrorized Israel and sabotaged. And Syria started bombing the kibbutzes and their settlements. Gamal Nasser sent Egyptian troops into the Sinai and announced that Egypt was prepared to declare war on Israel. King Hussein of, of uh, Jordan put his army under Nasser's control. Iraq had joined with Nasser and King Hussein. Egypt, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq declared war on Israel. Israel mobilized. On June 5th, 1967, it's a day I'll never forget as long as I live as a young pastor because Israel made a preemptive strike on June 5th, 1967 and bombed all the airfields in Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, destroying 452 planes in three hours. The war lasted six days. Israel marched toward Cairo, ready to take Cairo. We thought, this is it. This is World War III. This is Armageddon. It was preached by prophets, uh, God's prophets all over. And uh, it was from the pulpits where I was. I, I said the same thing. This is World War III. It's all over. And this nation was in 
absolute panic. And <clears throat> we thought that was it. Israel smashed the Jordanian army. They ran over the Golan Heights, dropped their weapons, and ran frightened. Israel moved to the very edge of Cairo. Iraq was helpless. And on June 10th, they called a ceasefire. Six-day war, and Israel prevailed. 1973, this is 33 years ago, Yom Kippur War. Again, Egypt, Syrian troops massed at the ceasefire lines again. Israel mobilized again. 2 p.m., October 6, 1973, Arabs struck suddenly. In the south, Egypt sent in 70,000 troops across the Sinai, 1,000 tanks across the Suez Canal. And in the north, 40,000 Syrian troops moved in with 800 tanks and a huge army. Iraq sent troops. Russia sent in all kinds of ammunition and weapons. Israel armed again and became a powerful uh, force against these and again pushed the Jordanians back to within 25 miles of Damascus. Again pushed Nasser back to the border of the Suez Canal. And again, people said this is the last war. All the armies, the prophets were saying all the armies are gathered around Jerusalem now, and this is the end. <clears throat> Israel prevailed. The problem is Russia <clears throat> threatened to move in with their own forces. And you remember in 1973, all our forces were on alert all over the world. And there was, there was a tremendous threat. Uh, the world was in panic. It's, I don't know if some of you remember that 33 years ago. And remember the OPEC cut oil production 5% on America and Holland. Remember the long lines at gas stations. It was a fearful time, and everyone said this is the end. This is World War III. <clears throat> 1973. You remember that. And then in 1974, terrorist groups from the Al Fatah began to plant explosions. Explosions and human bodies were exploding. PLO started using young men as human explosives. <clears throat> Israel, 1979, a year later, could not take it anymore, and they started bombing the... Uh, <clears throat> Headquarters of PLO bombed, bombed it and held prisoner uh, the leaders of PLO. Now, again, in 2-6, the Arabs have forgot the, hist uh, the lessons of history, and now we have a terrorist organization called the Hezbollah. Now, now folks, this is not, and you've got to understand this, I'm not a politician, I'm not an expert in the Middle East, but I know my Bible, and I was there after, right after the war in 1973 in Israel. There, the, the Jordanian, they took us up on the Golden Heights, and we were one of the first groups in there. At that time, the cross and switchblade was popped around the world, and I was treated as a celebrity. Allowed to go up on the Golden Heights, Jordanian tanks were still burning. We were one of the first to go down. The doors were open, went down. Some of the first Americans to see the Wailing Wall. And I saw the hand of God. I saw how God protected Israel. That's when I became truly a burden for the people of Israel. And this is not a war between Israel and Hezbollah. This is a war of Islam against Christianity. This is, folks, this is against Christ. These, folks, the enemy is not Lebanon. It's really not the Hezbollah. This is probably going to have a ceasefire. I don't see this is the end of the war unless Iran comes in. But an army official, the head of the Israeli army, and their Knesset has said they will not allow Iran to get a hydrogen bomb or nuclear weapons, which means they have to bomb out all of Iran's uh, facilities, and they know where they are. They have the biggest spy agency in the world, and they will do it. If that happens, then we are in the Third World War. But, folks, 
This, this is, you know, the Lord has said we'll get, armies will gather around Jerusalem. Well, since 1948, that's happened five times. This is the sixth time. So we have to keep it in perspective. But for us, we don't look at headlines. If you are a lover of Christ, you know, the, the Shiites in, in the, the mullahs, they are running it. The Shiites are hated even among many of the other groups in Iraq, and they're the ones that are causing the problem. They are the demon-possessed leaders of Islam, determined to wipe Israel off the map, and every one that's left would have to become an Islamic to survive. And that is where it's headed. It's, it's a threat to the United States. So when we pray for Israel, we are praying also, that Islamic forces will be driven back. This is absolute demonic war against the true Church of Jesus Christ. And until you see that, you watch the news and you'll start taking sides. And you'll see all of the devastation of war. But, folks, that is nothing compared to the devastation. And, folks, when we were in – how how timely – our conference was in Israel. Folks, I remember the first night when we called all the people to prayer. What a sound went up to heaven. The weeping and the crying and the praying. It was the Holy Spirit praying through people. We've been receiving emails and they're saying it was a visitation of the Holy Spirit. It was not a conference. And shortly after this war just broke out, but I think God in, in some way was trying to encourage the body of Christ. We met Arab pastors. I had uh, in Haifa, I had meetings with some Arab pastors and what godly men. In Lebanon, there are many believing Christians, many of them having to flee. And we hurt for them and we pray for them. When we talk about praying for Israel, we're praying for God's people all over that region. But God is moving in every Islamic country on the face of the earth. There's an underground church, and God is still moving, and we can give him thanks for that. <clears throat> Having said that, I want to get to my message. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I want to speak to you. about the sparrows and the hair on your head. Father, we thank you that we have a hope in these days. We are not bound by the events that happen. We, we can look back to history and we can see how God has had his way. God has everything under control from the very beginning to this day. Lord, I pray you encourage and lift up our spirits today. We are not those that sorrow like the world sorrows. We do not tremble as the world trembles because we have a hope that's based on an eternal salvation. Now, Lord, speak clearly to our hearts and chase all fear from our hearts and let us stand as believers, able, Lord, even in this time to rejoice in you, not because of the suffering, but in spite of the suffering. Nothing, no one can take this joy of Jesus out of our hearts. We magnify your name now. Spirit of God, come and speak through me. Speak to us and let us be able to walk away from this church this morning with our hearts at peace and at rest in the Lord. Hallelujah. We don't preach politics from this pulpit, Lord. We preach the governing power of a sovereign God. Hallelujah. And the glory of his son through his crucifixion and resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Love it every day you wake up now and turn on the news. It's another frightening experience. Terrorists blowing up trains in Spain. Terrorists blowing up trains in India. Hundreds and hundreds in India die through this terrorism. A disastrous earthquake last year in Pakistan. Hundreds of thousands still homeless and still hungry. After the math of the tsunami, there are still thousands and even hundreds of thousands homeless, hungry, and hurting. You, you, you listen to these news reports. 
think of what's happened in the past two years, especially even in the United States, all the hurricanes in Florida, Katrina strikes and destroys much of America, one of America's major cities. Even now, there are thousands upon thousands of acres burning in Texas and Oklahoma, Utah, and California. Never before in the history of the country have been so many fires, hurricanes. And now the whole world's focused on North Korea, where a mad dictator fires off missiles and threatens the whole world, and no world leader seems to be able to know what to do about him. A mad, devil-possessed dictator. Now we have a mad, devil-possessed dictator in Iran, or Iran declaring they're going to, to have nuclear bombs with one ambition, is that's to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, blasting the nation. And nobody seems to be able to deal with it. And then came Gaza and Lebanon. And while all these things are breaking out, scientists, it's, just, it, it's amazing what is coming in the way of, of, of bad news. This is a bad news generation. This past week I heard uh, a doctor had just attended leaders, world leaders, uh, scientists and others about the avian flu, and I, I had to turn it off. I, I just couldn't handle it. They, they said there's no question about it. Over 15 now humans have died from the avian flu. They're waiting for a mutation, and if that happens, they say one-fifth of the world's population is going to die. But, folks, we get this input from all over. Every day you turn on the news now, almost every hour it's changing. And now the world, the, the secular world, says there are no more solutions. Everything is spinning out of control. Every time I go into a restaurant, almost every time, you, you see this look on the face of people. Uh, my daughter had the waiter sit down and said, what, what's happening? Found out she was a Christian. Said, what's happening? I'm scared. Everybody around me is scared. There, there's an absolute panic, folks. I, I've been through this before. I've been through these panics. They say the people, the secular people, especially those who are in the very liberal column, say that there, there is no divine governance. There's no governance now. No one is governing the universe. In other words, nobody's in control. Everything is spinning out of control. Now, we've been warned that God said he'd shake everything that can be shaken, so we should not be surprised. We understand that. But, folks, and, unless you and I get a hold of something from the Scripture, unless we get our faith founded so strong, you're going to have to do it because it's going to be intensified. There's no going to be letting up. There will probably be a, a temporary ceasefire where we're at now. But things are happening that have never happened before in any of these past events that we've been talking about. And everybody, everybody knows something is about to break. James Robinson, a friend of mine who's on television, uh, sent me uh, his latest warning and <clears throat> asked me to sign up on it. I didn't feel led to sign up, but he said God has shown him and then Pat Robertson uh, that a great world-shaking event is going to come and change the course of the earth and the world and civilization as we know it. Well, some of us have been saying that for a long time. And, but, folks, that's not the message of the Church of Jesus Christ. We can see these things. We can hear them. But when they tell me that there's no divine governance, when there's nobody in control of the universe, all we have to do is go to our Bible all we have to do, go to the Word, and we read. Isaiah the prophet said, Come, listen, all you nations, and hear this, all you people of the earth. That's Isaiah 34. He said, I want, you to, I want you to give me your good ear. And then he proceeds to tell them. And this is what he said. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor of all nations. He is the governor of all nations. Isaiah 40th chapter. Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're counted as small dust in his balance. All nations before him are as nothing. They're counted to him less than nothing. 
It is God who sits upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. To whom will you liken me? That's the word of God. Of course, God knows everything that's happening on the face of the earth. Nothing happens without his knowledge or his governance. And he is in control of all things. And he knows where it begins. He knows where it is now. and He knows how it's going to end. But I want to tell you that the eye of God is not on ten God dictators around the world. He's not, his eye is not focused on world events. I want you to hear me close. That's not where his focus is. He has that. He knows the end from the beginning. He, he, there is a map. There is a plan of God, and it's coming to fruition. But in the meantime, while you and I sit here and listen to the news, where is his eye focused? What is the focus of God's eye? What is he looking about? What is his greatest concern right now in this particular year, this particular month, and this particular day right now? God said of the leaders of the world and the dictators and these mullahs, these demon-possessed mullahs, no sooner, Isaiah said for the chapter, no sooner are they planted, no sooner than they take root, I blow on them, and they wither, and the world whirlwind sweeps them away as chaff, and I reduce them to nothing. Now, folks, I have lived through a world war. When I was a boy, about seven years old, my, I was riding with my father in the hills of Pennsylvania. We were coming from a meeting he had conducted. Soft music was playing on the radio, and suddenly it's interrupted by a news bulletin. Pearl Harbor has just been bombed. Hawaii is in panic. Warships have been sunken and destroyed. And my dad said, this is it. This is the end. This is what we've been prophesying. Then came the blackouts, and we lived in a little town, and they had blackouts and sirens were ringing. In a little town, there were no bombers around, but everybody all over the country was in, in great panic. And when you went to school, they, they passed out these little cartoons of Hirohito, this, the world Satan. And we were taught to hate the Japanese and Hirohito and the emperor of Japan. He was the great Satan. And, of course, in Germany, there was another dictator a tin god had set himself up terrorizing all of Europe and then into Russia. And it was a terrifying time. Wars were going on all over the world. Bombs were falling. Millions of soldiers were dying. There were gas shortages and food shortages and coupons. And Hitler seemed unstoppable. He was going to take Russia, then move to England. He wanted to take the whole world wanted to be a world dictator. We had Hirohito in Japan. We had uh, Hitler in Germany, in Europe. And then we had Stalin in Russia, murdering millions of his own people. And I remember the cartoons, and I remember all of the pictures, and I remember the panic, and I remember the prophecies, and I remember all these things that come by. But, folks, I live to see the day. And I'll never forget the picture of Hirohito on on a battleship. And MacArthur was there, and with his head down in humility, he was signing papers of surrender. And Hitler dies in a bunker of suicide, and they can't find anything but his ashes. Stalin dies a wretched death. All gone. God said, no sooner they planted no sooner they take root, I did poof, I blow on them, and a whirlwind carries them away. <laughs> Saddam, who terrorized Iraq, is now uh, a dying man sitting under terror, ready to be executed in a very short time from now. Where are all these world leaders? Where are all those that cause panic in the world? Folks, there's been a, there's been a lot of panic in my lifetime over the years. I don't panic in what I see today. I've been through it before. I, I, I know, I know that at the end, 
I don't care how I go, because if I, I go, I don't care what happens or how it happens. That's instant glory to me. It should be instant glory to you until we lose the very fear of death. Devil can't hurt you. No news can hurt you. The moment you're ready to lay down your life and say, I'm not living for this world. Live or die. I am the Lord's. These emperors are gone. Turn to Luke 21 and just keep in mind what Jesus told us to do. The 21st chapter of Luke. Starting at verse 25, Luke 21, verse 25, there should be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And what does this say? And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the rays warring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Oh, folks, remember what Jesus said then. You're to look up. Look up because your redemption draws nigh. He said when you see these things begin to happen, just begin. That means when you start seeing these things, lay hold of your faith. Anchor your faith. Get into the word of God. Seek his face. Draw nigh unto him and get this solid, unwavering faith established in your heart because it's going to intensify. I don't think anybody could stand in this pulpit and tell you. Nobody knows how terrifying. According to, to one of the national news services yesterday, they said the next thing is a dirty bomb is going to shake the world. Everybody is anticipating something. Folks, we should be on anticipation of anything of this world anticipating only one thing, then shall the Son of Man appear in his glory and in his might. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, then look up. And in a time of all shaking, I'm telling you, his eye is on the sparrow. I want you to follow me through. He said, behold, I'm reading from Psalms 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is where? In the Mideast. No, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy. Don't fear those who can only kill the body but not the soul. Fear only him who has the power to destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, that's in Matthew 10. We just turn, turn left to Matthew 10, 10th chapter of Matthew. Folks, these are familiar scriptures, but you need to anchor them. We need to anchor them in our souls. Matthew 10. Let's look at verse, beginning of verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Now, folks, listen to me. Barclay, a wonderful godly professor who, who is now dead, Barclay said the original is it's from a root Aramaic word that says uh, to hop or skip along the ground. And it's a picture of a bird that's fallen out of the ground. It's not just God, Jesus, or God the Father counting the birds, the little sparrows that fall to the ground. But even their wounded hop, even their wounded fall from the nest. It's not just that. He said it infers. Jesus is inferring. And Jesus is saying every sparrow that falls from its nest and hops along the ground wounded, he has the knowledge of that. He understands it. Now, folks, this was given to the disciples. Look at the next verse. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. So fear you not. Therefore, you're worth many more sparrows. He, he said, I value those little sparrows. There's some value to those. And, and I'm concerned about every detail of their life. Think of it. The apostles had just been called to go forth 
into various cities, and they, they are told that they're not going to have a place to live. They're told not to take any money. They're told that they're going to suffer. They're going to be brought before synagogues and judges, and they're going to be persecuted. And he starts naming all these things that are going to happen to them as they set out to do his will. Godly men in the center of God's will. He said, you're going to be hated. You're going to be despised. You'll be stoned. And, and that had to be a very fearful time because the Lord already told them he's going to leave them. And, and, and here are these fearful disciples facing the bleakest outlook of life. What kind of a ministry is this? What kind of a future? And the Lord is really trying to tell them, one day you're going to drink of the cup that I cup, that, that I have to drink. And they know that's death. So th- this is almost like a death sentence to, to obey God and to fulfill his mission on earth. And I'm sure the Lord sees the fear and senses the fear in his disciples. And so he, he comes up with and, and the, the Lord makes it so clear that a child can understand it. And he says, look, he said, don't don't fear all that. But let, let me give you an antidote against fear. I want to give you an antidote. This should take away the fear of your life. He, he knows that they're going to be walking among sparrows and birds. And, and he said, you just look at that sparrow. Look at the one hopping along the ground. I, I know all about it. I I have the knowledge of every bird. Now, you think of this. Now, uh, modern theologians say that this is just uh, uh, a quaint saying of Jesus. It, almost like it's a flippant thing. Suddenly, Jesus thought at the last moment. No, Jesus never uh, plays with words. He's speaking the mind of God because he is God in the flesh. And he said, you're going to have hard times, but everywhere you go and you are down, just look at the little bird. Look at the little sparrows falling around. And look at the clouds sometimes black with sparrows. Black with, and it's not just the sparrows, it's all the little birds and the birds of the universe. And think of all the birds in the universe. And God says, my eye is on the sparrow. Your father's eye is on the sparrow. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you until you ask the Holy Ghost to make it real. I, I, I got this message, and I, I took one to the doctor this past week, and I'm sitting in a chair, and there's a big uh, window floor to ceiling. I'm looking out, and there's a little sparrow playing right there in front of me, right on the other side of the window. He, he was just chirping away and playing and picking up worms. And I said, look at him and get it. My eye is on that bird. What makes you think my eye is not on you? What makes you think I'm not concerned about every detail in your life? There's no detail in our lives that he is. And then he says, furthermore, I've numbered your father's number, every hair on your head. Now, if you don't have hair, sir, (laughs) he's numbered it. He knows it's zero. Now, I'm not trying to be facetious. Folks, Jesus is saying to his disciples, look, I want to show you how your father cares for you in hard times. Every detail, your money, your house, your family, your husband, your wife, your marriage, your, your, your bills, everything in your life. He knows about it. He's concerned about it. He's a loving father. He said, now, don't fear. Don't be afraid because your father knows. Folks, I I have seen and heard. I've been reading so many letters of those who write to us from around the world. And, And I can honestly tell you, if you love Jesus and you're sitting here, I would say 99 out of 100 of you could say that you're going through one of the worst testing times in your life. This has to be a majority. Now, maybe you just got married and you're on honeymoon and and it's honeymoon time. (laughs) But it won't be long. (laughs) 
These tests come. But it's more than that, folks. It's the mad devil who knows his time is short, who is pushing the Shiites now to take over all of Israel and take over all of the <clears throat> Western Bloc and so, or the Eastern Bloc. And so this is a time of great testing. I, I, I got a letter uh, <clears throat> this past week that just blew me away. It's a pastor, a godly pastor of a church, small church in the south, with about 50 people. And <clears throat> he, he has a five-year-old grandson. And the mother is alone now, his daughter. I, I think it was a divorce. And so he's been babysitting that child while the mother works as much as he could. So he became so bonded to that five-year-old son. And he put him to bed. This had been a few years ago. He put him to bed. And when he woke up, the baby was dead from SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. His jewel, the apple of his eye. No warning. The child was healthy and strong. He said it was the most devastating time in his life. And that wasn't the end of it. The mother couldn't handle it. This is the pastor's daughter. And his daughter couldn't handle the death of her son, the five-year-old. So she overdosed on Oxycontin. Cotton. And he, he got a call. He wasn't in town. He got a call and said, your daughter's dead. But she survived, but she was brain damaged. And now for the past few years, this dear pastor has been caretaking his daughter 24 hours a day, seven days a week. She can talk, and she, she's alive, brain, but her body, the rest of her body is paralyzed. And then he goes into a study and he said, my God, my God, what's going on in the next year, this past year? <clears throat> he's in the porch in the back and his teenage, his youngest son comes to him and says, Dad, I've got some heavy news, but I know you have a heart problem and you can't take it. He said, oh, well, son, I have to know. He said, I've been indicted for two murders. I killed the pusher who gave drugs to my sister. This was the daughter that was paralyzed. And he said, I, I'm indicted for his murder and his girlfriend. Now, let me stop for just a minute. I'll come back to the story. But let me tell you, when that man is in his office, and he is overwhelmed. He took out the picture of his little five-year-old grandson. I'm not telling you a tear-jerking story because I just talked to this man two days ago. And I called him. A wonderful man of God. He said, Brother Dave, I took my baby's picture out of the door. And I, there were a number of pictures. And I just lost it. I just lost it. Folks, let me ask you something. Do you think that man's thinking about the Mideast? Do you think he's talking about thinking about the war, the economy? <clears throat> Do you think he's focused on any world event? No. He's, he, he's fi focused on one thing. I am in over my head, and I don't know what to do. Folks, let me take it a step further. If this man's sitting at his desk and he looks out the window and there's a sparrow's nest and he just looks across the pane, outside the pane, and that sparrow falls to the ground and the father sees it and the father knows it, who would tell me that on the other side of the pane where a pastor sits weeping and broken and not knowing which way to turn, how can you tell me, how can anybody say that God's interested in that sparrow, but not interested in this man? That his focus, if it's there, it's here, surely, because he's of such value to the Lord, that man. 
And when I talked, he said, Brother Dave, I was sitting there overwhelmed and thinking, why fight anymore? It's enough. And he said, the presence of Jesus, he said, the door opened. And the presence of Jesus came in the room. And I sensed that he was sitting opposite my desk. The beautiful, incredible presence of Christ. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, I know. And he said, I'll give you two options. If you want to quit, that's your option. You can tell everybody about your problems. Every passerby, everyone who knows you, everyone in your circle, anyone, you can tell them why you're quitting. You can tell them about the death of your grandson. Tell them about your daughter. Tell them about your son who's now in prison awaiting a death sentence. Now, can you imagine a father sitting in his office knowing his son is awaiting a death sentence? He said, you have an option. Your option is you can quit and I'll still love you. You can tell people your story. A lot of people will sympathize with you. He said, you have another option. And he he spoke it with such love and grace. He said, just kindly put the picture back in your desk and trust me. Just trust me now. Nothing's going to happen to you except in my will. And I know what I'm doing. And I'm going to give you the grace that you need. Your option is to just go ahead. You can quit. You can go that way. And I'm still your father. But the other option is to get up, take courage, and walk out and face your future because I'm not finished with you. He said, Brother Dave, I just put the picture away. He said, I'm not going to sit there and mourn over it anymore. And he said, I was filled with peace and grace. It's been almost a year now. He said, Brother Dave, I still not over all my battles, but I know his hand is on me. And and I I quote him a scripture. We do this. We so flippantly throw people who are suffering. We throw a scripture verse. And I said, well, Pastor, the Bible says, uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them all. He said, please, Brother Dave, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I believe it, but I'm not that year, so that doesn't help me. You see, sometimes people hurt so much. They're so bound up, and Heavenly Father understands that. I don't believe Jesus comes to somebody like that, hurting and bruised. And he, Lord won't come to you and judge you. He understands the pain. He, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And he's saying, just, just remember... All you have to do is is touch the head of your hair. And just remember, I have numbered every hair. And every time you see a little bird, I'm trying to make you understand that I understand that I care. And folks, Jesus did come to that man. And that's been the hope. He said, I believe that Jesus has given me courage as I go. And this man now has a, he has an understanding of the love of God like he's never understood before in his life. And now he's laying everything down. I'm praying with him about one certain battle he has. And, and, and uh, he, he, he said, they don't need to know my name, but I do want you to pray. Folks, in these days that are becoming so overwhelming, And I don't think we understand that. I'm going to close here in just a minute. I don't think we understand how much we need one another. How much we need to have a comforting word from God. And and some of these scriptures, I, I, I'm asking God to give me wisdom to know how to use the word of God. Because you see, even Joseph, when he was in his worst trial, the word of God tried him. The word of God tried him. You look at some of these scriptures. All things work together for good to them of God and are called according to his purpose. And you wait and wait and wait and you can't see the good. 
And all the time, God is working. God is saying, if you'll, if you'll just rest in me now, just rest. Don't even try to measure your faith. Don't try to figure it out. I was walking down the road praying at a place I call my Emmaus Road. And I'm walking down the road and so overwhelmed. And I said, Lord, I don't know if I have great faith right now. I don't know if I have little faith. I don't know if I have much faith at all. I, I just heard, and I think I may have said this last time. I said, Lord, just hug me. I don't want to figure it out anymore. I just want you to hug me. And I want you to know that your eye is on me and you're in control of everything. And as long as your eye is on me, I'm going to be okay and I'm going to come out on top. Will you stand, please? Oh, beloved, stay close to the word. Hide this word in your heart. Go to the word and find your answers. There's no counselor. There's no one going to be able to answer the questions. Your counselors are called of God. Yes, you go for counseling for marriage or whatever it is. But in the final analysis, you have to have the Holy Ghost give you a word from heaven. I think it was Pastor Neil was given a, the words to a song we sing here. Just one word. From heaven, everything's all right. Now, Father, we face uh, days that are going to try the hearts of men. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. But I pray you, Lord, that everyone in this house and everyone within the sound of my voice, O oh Holy Spirit, help us to understand that God, a loving Father, will allow nothing in our lives. He will allow nothing except for the purposes of His own nature. It will be according to His love. And Lord, You said there's going to be sufficient grace. My grace is sufficient. My grace is enough to see You through. My grace is enough to bring You to victory. So we will not, we will face the future, Lord, fearless. Oh, Lord, we'll have those natural fears that come upon us. But we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Lord, everyone here that's been walking in the Spirit, help us to recognize your presence, to acknowledge your presence, and to wait for your voice, to hear that still, small voice of the Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ, who is the Spirit of Christ. And, Lord, let us hear that inner voice, that inner all-knowing voice saying, I'm with you. My eye is upon you. I've seen you, and I will hear, and I will answer in my time. But meanwhile, I will give you the strength to bear it. Lord, I'll give you the strength to endure it. Oh, God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Audience, and those in the annex, wherever you are, can we just lift our hands and thank God for his faithfulness, how faithful he has been. How faithful he is, how faithful he will be in the days ahead. Father, we raise our hands to say thank you. You've taken us thus far. We've been through the waters. We've been through the fire. And Lord, you're going to take us through till Jesus comes or till you take us home. Lord, lift every spirit of worry and fear and bondage and fretting. We have nothing to fear. Lord, even the President Roosevelt once said we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Oh, but Lord, no. He said we're to fear him who can cast into hell. We do have the fear of God in our hearts for the sake of the whole world. But, oh, God, we have a father who cares. Your eye is on the sparrow, so I know it's on me. Hallelujah. Now, give him thanks for that. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise. There are some of you that are here tonight, this, uh, this morning, that are really not walking near Jesus. Folks, those who are near him, he said, draw near to me and I'll draw nigh to you. More and more, that's becoming the theme of my life and, and the call of my life. Just spend time drawing near to the Lord. On the subway, wherever you are, just keep drawing nigh to the Lord. 
drawing closer to him. The, the greatest uh, thing in my life as far as keeping all anxiety, it's not just a, my scope of history and what I've seen, but more than that, it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That he is here. He's not out in the universe. He's not out trying to take care of some world event or some crisis. He's not in the middle of a crisis. Or, though he's there, he's everywhere. But his main focus, the main work is right here. How many believe the Holy Ghost indwells you, that he is here? Raise your hand right now. Well, well then, why would you ever again fear anything, any news? Dirty bomb, clean bomb unclean bomb, any kind of bomb, any kind of tragedy. Don't go through this city and subways wondering what's going to happen. Glory be to God. Just, just, just say, every time I got in the airplane, I used to be afraid of flying, but now I just say, I have a conscience clear before God and before man. Jesus, if I go down, I'm going straight to heaven and I'm going to be standing beside you. That takes the fear out of it. If your conscience is not clear, that's when the fear comes. Clear conscience before God and man. Now, if you're here this morning, and I say this in love, we don't try, we don't try to make, put people on the spot. But there is such a thing as taking a stand. And if you're here up in the balcony and here and in the annex, You've not taken that clear stand. You're not walking close to Jesus. Maybe you know, have known the Lord. I'm meeting so many. We use the word backslid, means sliding away from the presence of the Lord, sliding away from that intensity and that love. And if you've been slipping away, call it what you want, slipping away, or just not right, and you know it, and it becomes clearer to you because the thermometer of fear keeps rising in your heart. So I invite you to step out of your seat and come and let me pray with you and for you. And this church will pray with you to believe that you walk out of here and now. And some of you brought a heavy, heavy burden. I I talked about what happened to this dear pastor. But something very serious is happening in your life. And it's caused you maybe to question, God, where are you? You can have your faith renewed. Sometimes it's the best to take a step. And so I'm stepping out of that unbelief. We don't count heads here. We don't know how many come. We don't take a record of that. Only the Lord does. And while I pray, I'm just going to pray for you right now. Up on the balcony, go the stairs on either side. And in the annex, just step forward between the screens. So you won't block the screen because the Lord's there. And I'll pray with you and Be just as effective as if you were here in the main auditorium. Step out while I'm praying. We're not looking for masses of people. We're just looking for those who are honest before the Lord right now, saying, Pastor Dave, I've got to have a touch from the Lord today. I need my faith renewed. You may be not even serving Christ. You don't know him. You've been running from God, or you don't even know Jesus. I want you to come and join these and let the Lord do a miracle work in your heart today. Heavenly Father, I pray for every hurting spirit, every hurting soul and body, everyone in this house that is desperately in need of a touch. Lord Jesus, we all need a touch, but I'm talking about those who are at a point of desperation, those who are at a point of being overwhelmed. Lord Jesus, we believe that here at this front of this church, right now, you can answer prayer. You can do a mighty work in their hearts. In Jesus' name, follow these that are coming now, please. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved, and he that keepeth you will not slumber. He that keep you shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord will preserve you from evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this day forth, even forevermore. The Lord said, I'm going to preserve your going out and your coming in. Father, now pray this with me right now. Lord Jesus, I bring to you all my fears and my unbelief. I come, Lord, 
asking you to give me faith. Give me your faith, Jesus. I want to have confidence in you. And for the rest of my days, I want to trust you. Cleanse me. Purge my heart from all that is not like you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your promises. I take it to my heart that the Lord has promised me to keep me from falling and present me faultless before the throne of his Father. Now let's give him thanks. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you praise. For you are worthy. Glory be to God. This is the conclusion of the message.